Hey, it's a little di different today. Um, I am out at my other home um, in the country. So you're going to hear some traffic going on the road. And Sophie's with me, but I don't know how long that'll last. Once she sees a cat, it's all over. So today is Thursday, March. I can't even read with my glasses on. 26th. And I miss you guys. And I just heard that we're going to be out a little bit longer. So I really, really miss you guys. I want to give a little shout out to Santana today. Santana's been watching my videos every day as well as Devin. So, all right. Just wanted to give a little shout out to you. We're starting a new book today. Well, not brand new, but anyway, it's a new book. For us, Henry and the Paper Route. Written by Beverly Cleary, of course. Is there any other author? No. Henry and the Paper Wrap. Here's our table of contents. Chapter 1, Henry's Bargain. One Friday afternoon, Henry Huggins sat on the front steps of his white house on Clickitat Street with his dog, Ribsy, at his feet. He was busy trying to pick the cover off an old golf ball to see what was inside. It was not very interesting work, but it was keeping him busy until he could think of something better to do. What he really wanted, he decided, was to do something different. But how he wanted that something to be different, he didn't know. And here's a picture of him. I'm not sure you could even see this. Hi, Henry, a girl's voice called as Henry picked away at the tough covering of the golf ball. It was Beatrice, or Beezus, as everybody called her. As usual, she was followed by her little sister, Ramona, who was hopping and skipping along the sidewalk. When Ramona came to a tree, she stepped into its shadow and then jumped out suddenly. Hi, Beezus, Henry called hopefully. Can you get down? Ay, ay, ay. For a girl, Beezus was pretty good at thinking up interesting things to do. What are you doing? he asked when the girls reached his house. He could see that Beezus had a ball of red yarn in her hands. Going to the store for mother, answered Beezus as her fingers worked at the yarn. No, I mean, what's in your hands? asked Henry. Oh, I'm knitting on a spool, Beezus explained. You take a spool and drive four nails in one end, and you take some yarn and a crochet hook, like this. See? Deftly, she lifted the loops of yarn over the nails in the spool to show Henry what she was doing. Yeah, but what does it make? Henry asked. A long piece of knitting. Beezus held up her work to show Henry a tail of knitted red yarn that came out of a hole in the center of the spool. But what is it good for? <laughs> Henry asked. I don't know, admitted Beezus, her fingers and the crochet hook flying. But it's fun to do. Ramona squeezed herself into the shadow of a telephone pole, and then she jumped out and looked quickly over her shoulder. What does she keep doing that for? Henry asked curiously as he picked off a large piece of a golf ball cover. He was getting closer to the inside now. Oh, she's just trying to get rid of her shadow, Beezus explained. I keep telling her she can't, but she keeps trying anyway. Mother read her that poem, I have a little shadow that goes in and out with me, and what can be the use of him is more than I can see. She decided she didn't want a shadow tagging around after her. Beezus turned to her sister. Come on, Ramona. Mother said not to dawdle. And here's a picture of Ramona. Oh, here, I'm going to... Sorry. Not the ideal situation, but I thought it'd be fun to be outside today. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake, muttered Henry as the girls left, knitting a long red tail that wasn't good for anything and trying to get rid of a shadow. Man, the dumb things girls did. Just Henry's opinion, by the way. They didn't make sense. Then he looked at the battered golf ball in his hands and the thought came to him that what he was doing didn't make much sense either. In disgust, he tossed the golf ball onto the lawn. Ribsy uncurled himself from the foot of the steps and got up to examine the golf ball. He picked it up in his teeth and trotted to the top of the driveway where he dropped it and watched it roll down the slope to the sidewalk. Just before it rolled out onto the street, he raced down and caught the ball in his mouth. Then he trotted back up the driveway and dropped the ball again. Henry watched Ribsy play with the golf ball, and he decided that this afternoon, everyone, even his dog, was busy doing something that made no sense at all. What he wanted to do was something that made sense, something important, something like something... Well, he couldn't think exactly what, but something important. 
Hi there, Henry. Oh, hi, neighbor. <laughs> a folded newspaper landed with a thump on the grass in front of Henry. Oh, hi, Scooter, answered Henry. Glad of an excuse to talk to somebody, even if it was Scooter McCarthy. Scooter was in the seventh grade at Glenwood School, while Henry was only in the fifth grade. Naturally, Scooter felt pretty superior when Henry was around. Henry looked at Scooter sitting on his bike with one foot against the curb and his canvas bag of journals over his shoulders. He thought it must be fun to ride down the street, tossing papers to the right and to the left and getting paid for it. Say, Henry, said Scooter. Mr. Capper, he's in charge of all the journal boys around here. He's looking for somebody to take a route, a paper route. You don't happen to know anybody around here who would like to deliver newspapers, do you? Sure, answered Henry eagerly. Me? Talk about opportunity knocking. It was practically pounding on his door. A paper route was important, and Henry knew that delivering the journal was exactly what he wanted to do. Oh, please don't be a cat. It made sense. Scooter looked thoughtfully at Henry, who waited for him to scoff the way he usually did at almost anything Henry said. But this time Scooter surprised Henry. He didn't scoff like, right, that's what that means. Instead, he said seriously, no, I don't believe you could do it. Wow, Henry would have felt better. Oh, there goes my bookmark. If Scooter had said, you deliver papers, ha, huh? big joke, or something like that, then Henry would have known that Scooter was just talking. But to have Scooter actually say, no, I don't believe you could do it. Well, Henry knew Scooter really meant it. What's wrong with me delivering papers, Henry demanded. I can throw just as good as you can. Well, for one thing, you're not old enough, Scooter explained. You have to be 11 and have a paper to have a paper route. I'm practically 11, said Henry. I have a birthday in a couple of months. Less than that, really. I feel 11. And if you can deliver papers, I guess I could too. Hi again, neighbors. <laughs> yeah, but you aren't 11, Scooter pointed out as he pulled another journal out of his bag and pedaled on down the street. Henry watched Scooter toss a journal with an experienced flip of his wrist onto the front steps of a house farther down the block. So Scooter really didn't think he could handle a paper route, and he wasn't joking either. Henry began to think. He'd show Scooter that's what he would do. Maybe Scooter was older and did have a paper route, but he would catch up with him somehow. He would go to Mr. Capper's house on Knott Street, the house with the horse chestnut tree in the front, where the boys had chestnut fights every fall, and he would ask Mr. Capper for the paper route. He would act so grown up and so businesslike that Mr. Capper wouldn't think to ask his age. And even if he did, Henry could say he was practically 11. After all, if Mr. Capper was asking around for a boy to deliver papers, he must be pretty hard up for somebody to work for him. Why, the job was as good as Henry's already. And with a paper route and a birthday, he would be as good as caught up with Scooter. Then it occurred to Henry that Mr. Capper might have asked other paper boys besides Scooter if they knew someone who would like to deliver papers. Do you want down? Okay, well, you're on a short leash, girl. It might be a good idea to go over to Mr. Capper's house as fast as he could before some other boy beat him to it. Henry ran into the house and washed his hands as far up as his wrists. He ran a comb through his hair and pulled on his jacket, which he snatched off his bedpost. He was glad his mother was out shopping so he didn't have to stop and persuade her to let him have a paper route. He could do that after the route was his. After removing the unbusinesslike raccoon tail from the handlebars, Henry wheeled his bicycle out of the garage and was coasting down the driveway when Ribsy suddenly appeared and started to follow him. Go home, Henry ordered. Ribsy sat down on the sidewalk. He thumped his tail on the cement and looked hopefully at Henry. Good dog, said Henry. Yes, you're a good dog too. Come here, you're all caught up. One second, we're caught up. Here, just a second. All right, little girl. Oh, sugar, sorry about that. And that was her little ankle. Whoopsie. Um, oh. Anyway, Henry's, oh no, hearing Ribsy's license tag jingle. Oh, so sorry, I skipped a little spot. Sorry about that. Okay, good dog, said Henry, and he started to pedal down Clickitat Street. Ribsy galloped after him. Hearing Ribsy's license tag jingle, Henry looked over his shoulder. No, I told you to go home, he said. Ribsy looked hurt. He was used to following Henry wherever he went, and he couldn't understand why he could not go this time. Henry sighed. Sorry, fellow, he said, and pedaled back to the house. Come on, sissy. There, he got off his bicycle and led Ribsy by his collar up the front steps. I'd like to take you with me, but this is important. I cannot have a dog tagging along when I ask for a job. 
He shoved Ribsy through the front door and hurried down the steps. Oh my gosh, you really are that dumb. Go this way, come here. Oh my word, she got caught up. Ay, ay, ay. <sighs> He's, anyway, he did not look back because he knew that Ribsy, his paws on the windowsill, would be watching him. Henry zipped up his jacket so it would look neater and he ran his hand over his hair to make sure it was combed. A boy had to look his best when he asked for a job, even though he was practically sure the job was his if he got there in time. Henry practiced being grown up as he pedaled toward Mr. Capper's house. He steered his bicycle with one hand and jingled the nickels and the dimes in his pocket with his other hand. He sat up very straight to make himself look taller. He tried to think what to say to Mr. Camper. How do you do, he said politely to a telephone pole. I'm Henry Huggins. I heard you were looking for a paper boy. No, that wasn't quite right. He got off his bicycle to address a mailbox. Good afternoon, he said. My name is Henry Huggins. I understand you're looking for a boy to deliver papers. That was better. Then Henry spoke to an imaginary bunch of boys. Sorry, he said in a brief and businesslike way. I can't play ball with you right now. I have to start my route. Yes, that's what he would be saying after his visit to Mr. Capper. My route he said to himself again, and just speaking the words made him feel good, right? As he rode through the business district, Henry glanced at his reflection in the windows of the Rose City Barbershop and the Payless Drugstore and was pleased with what he saw. Business-like, that was Henry Huggins. Oh, and I forgot to show you the picture. Here's Henry talking to a mailbox because he's practicing. Oh, man, don't knock my computer down. <laughs> this could go sideways pretty soon if she knocks down my computer. Why? He probably wouldn't even have to tell Mr. Capper why he was calling. Mr. Capper would take one look at him, and right away he would see that there was a boy who could handle a paper route. Young man, do you want a job? He would ask Henry as soon as he opened the door. Maybe Mr. Capper would be so busy talking him into taking the paper route that all Henry needed to say would be, Yes, sir, I'll be glad to take the job. Already he could see himself pedaling down the street, throwing papers to the right and to the left with a perfect aim. He would never have to get off his bicycle and poke around in somebody's shrubbery for a paper that he missed on the porch. Not Henry Huggins. And the things he could buy with the money he had earned. Stamps for his collection. A flashlight. Two flashlights, one for his bike and one to keep in his room. He could even buy a real sleeping bag that he had admired in the sporting goods store. Then he could ask his friend Robert to come over and spend the night and sleep out in the backyard. It would be lots more fun to sleep in a real sleeping bag with a zipper instead of some old blankets his mother pinned together with safety pins. Just then, Henry came to the rummage sale in the vacant lot. Now, a rummage sale was something Henry knew all about, so it's kind of like a garage sale, it, because his mother had helped with such a sale only last year. A lot of ladies who belonged to a club gathered up all the old junk, they could find in their closets and basements and attics and garages and had a couple of men with trucks haul it all to a vacant lot, vacant means empty, where they spread it all out on boards set on sawhorses. They sold the junk or rummage as they called it for very low prices and they used the money to buy a TV set which they gave to the hospital. That's cool, huh? Since Henry liked old junk, he had enjoyed his mother's part in the rummage sale and had been sorry to see the old dishes and lampshades and baby buggies hauled away to be sold. He had been especially sorry to see a pair of old laundry tubs taken away because he had been sure they would have come in handy someday for something, but he didn't quite know what. But his mother had said firmly that he could not keep old laundry tubs in his room or in the garage either for that matter. Naturally, even though Henry was in a hurry, he had to stop to see how all the junk in his vacant lot, you know, in this vacant lot compared to his mother's collection of rummage. He leaned his bicycle against a telephone pole and joined the crowd. Racks of old clothes hung in the corner of the lot under a couple of billboards. Nearby was the furniture department, old-fashioned ice boxes, which is an old refrigerator, but they used ice instead, chairs with three legs, sofas with the springs popping out. All sorts of odds and ends were heaped on the board tables. Henry decided it was pretty good junk. He paused in front of an old electric fan. Oh, man, there were lots of things a boy could do with an electric fan, especially if it worked. But just what? Henry could not decide at the moment, but he was sure there must be lots. Yeah. How much is the fan? Henry asked the lady behind the table. 25 cents was the answer. The trouble was that Henry could not very well carry an old electric fan when he went to ask Mr. Capper for a job. It would look very unbusinesslike. 
If I pay for the fan now, could you hold it for me until I come back in about half an hour? Henry asked. Oh, I'm sorry, but the sale ends at 5.30, the lady told him. A junk man will come and buy up everything that's left over. Oh, Henry was disappointed. Oh, well, a job delivering papers was much more important than an old electric fan. Besides, when he got his route, he could buy a new fan if he wanted one. Uh-oh, do you see a cat? No, okay, that <laughs> worried me. As Henry started to leave, he glanced into a carton, what, and what he saw was a great surprise. Four kittens! One black and white, one gray with white paws, and two yellow and white striped lay sleeping in a corner of a box. They looked so tiny and helpless. <gasps> Poor little things. But there must be a mistake. Kittens were not junk. And here's our little kitten. I don't even know where that, I can't, it's really hard to see. I hope you can see anything right now. These kittens aren't for sale, are they? Henry asked a lady who was standing nearby. Yes, they are, answered the lady cheerfully. Fifteen cents apiece. They're very nice kittens. Their grandmother was a long-haired cat. Oh, Henry did not like the idea at all. People shouldn't go around selling kittens for rummage, as if they were old tea kettles or something. But wait, if nobody buys them for, at 5.30, will the junk man take them? Ah, uh, okay, never mind, she's pulling Henry. Henry asked anxiously. Henry was so upset about the kittens that he forgot he was in a hurry. For a minute, he even forgot he wanted a paper route. Oh no, answered the lady. I suppose someone will take them to the pound. She spoke as if kittens were not very important. The black and white kitten stirred and blinked its little gray eyes. Oh, Henry could not keep from touching the little soft furry head. The kitten yawned and showed its little teeny tiny pink tongue. And then it climbed on top of the other three kittens and curled itself into a little ball and went to sleep again. Oh, this was too much for Henry. I don't think you should let them go to the pound, he said. I don't either, agreed the lady. I'll tell you what I'll do. Since the sale is about over, I'll mark them all down for you from 15 cents to five cents a piece. <sighs> Dog hair everywhere. A nickel for a kitten? Now that was a real bargain. Henry gently stroked the black and white kitten with one finger and thought it over. If he bought the four tiny kittens, he would be saving them from the pound, and that was even more important than getting a bargain. Of course, his mother wouldn't let him keep all of them, but it should be easy to find good homes for the others. Then Henry remembered the paper route. He could not carry a box of kittens with him when he went to ask Mr. Capper for a job. That would be even less businesslike than carrying an old electric fan. And nothing was going to keep him from getting that paper out, not even kittens. Well, no, I guess not, Henry said to the lady. They're awfully nice kittens, though. The black and white kitten snuggled even deeper into the fur of the other three kittens. No, Henry told himself, I'm not going to do it. I am not going to buy them, even if they are only a nickel apiece. My route comes first. The little yellow kitten in its sleep. Oh, it's, it's kind of squashed. Henry remarked to the lady as he carefully pulled the little bundle of fur out from under the other kittens. Every minute made it more difficult for Henry to leave. Henry fingered the money in his pocket. Maybe he could leave the kittens somewhere along the way and pick them up after he had talked to Mr. Capper. No, that wouldn't work. A dog might get them. They were too little to know how to climb trees, and yet there must be some way to save them. Henry thought really hard. His jacket! It was just the thing. It was roomy. It had a tight knitted band around the waist, and it was a cloth jacket so air could get through. He could tuck four tiny sleeping kittens inside, zip it up, and no one would know the difference. <sighs> Dog hair, sorry. I'll take all four, said Henry, and he quickly produced two dimes from his pocket. Gently, he lifted the kittens one by one and slipped them inside his jacket. Then he pulled up the zipper. Maybe he looked a little plump around the middle, but no one would have would ever guess that he was hiding four kittens. It was late, Henry realized, as he got on his bicycle and tried to ride without joggling his kittens. He had spent too much time at the rummage sale. When he reached the district manager's house, he leaned his bike against the chestnut tree, ran his hand over his, ha ran his, hand over his hair, stood up straight, and tried to feel 11 years old. All at once, his mouth felt really dry. Good afternoon, Mr. Capper, he whispered to himself. My name is Henry Huggins. He walked up the steps and rang the doorbell. While he waited, he could feel his heart pounding. Oh, jeez, you're such a ding-dong. The door opened, and Henry found himself facing not Mr. Capper, but his daughter, who was, Henry knew, practically grown up. She was in high school. 
Uh, is Mr. Capper home? Henry managed to say to the girl. She was waving one hand back and forth to dry her red nail polish. Just a minute, the girl answered. Daddy, she called. A boy wants to see you. She continued to stand in the doorway, blowing on her red fingertips and ignoring Henry as if he were too young to even bother about. Henry stood up even straighter, and in a moment, a tall, thin man with crinkly gray hair appeared. He was wearing paint-smattered overalls and wiping his hands on a smeary rag, which he then stuffed into his hip pocket. Hello there, said Mr. Capper pleasantly. What can I do for you? Good afternoon, Henry recited in what had he hoped was a business-like voice while he tried to look 11 years old. My name... Henry stopped. He felt something move under his jacket. My name... He began again and stopped once more. A large police dog appeared from somewhere back of the house and joined Mr. Capper, who stood rubbing the dog's head and waiting for Henry to continue. Henry eyed the dog. The dog eyed Henry. Henry's already dry mouth felt like old flannel. Again, something moved under his jacket. Uh, my name is Henry Huggins, he managed to say, and then gulped. His name sounded peculiar when he said it out loud, almost as if it were somebody else's name. For an instant, Henry had a really funny feeling that maybe he wasn't really Henry Huggins after all. How do you do? answered Mr. Capper, by now plainly puzzled as to what Henry's visit was all about. How do you do? said Henry. No, that wasn't right. That wasn't what he meant to say. Now everything was all mixed up. Mr. Capper's daughter giggled, and Henry felt his face grow hot. He did not feel businesslike at all. He unzipped his jacket just a couple of inches. The dog stepped forward and sniffed at Henry. His ears perked up, giving him an alert look. Here, Major, said Mr. Capper sharply. Major barked. He looked eager, and his teeth were long and white. Henry's jacket began to move and then to heave, which means like up and down and up and down. Henry no longer felt 11 years old. He didn't even feel 10 years old. He winced as a kitten dug its little sharp claws into his skin. Ruff, said Major. Mr. Capper grabbed the dog by the collar and jerked him back. The kittens began to scramble around under Henry's jacket. Henry felt one of them climbing up the back of his t-shirt. Ooh, the little pinpricks of his tiny claws made him squirm. He clasped his hands around his waist and tried to hold the kittens down. <laughs> Mr. Capper looked amused and puzzled at the same time. Major strained at his collar. What have you got inside your jacket, son? Mr. Capper asked kindly. Uh, said Henry, keeping one eye on the dog and at the same time reaching around and poking through his jacket at the kitten between his shoulder blades. Another kitten scrambled up the front of his t-shirt and before Henry could even answer, Mr. Capper, it poked its little head out of Henry's jacket and announced its presence with a teeny tiny meow. Mr. Capper grinned and his daughter went out off with a gale of giggles. Hastily, Henry stuffed the kitten back into his jacket, but the kitten promptly popped out again. And here, <laughs> you can see the kitten. And then there's another one's tail. <laughs> oh my goodness gracious. Sorry, it's a long chapter. Henry stuffed it back and pulled the zipper all the way up. Oh, uh, 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 just some kittens I got at a rummage sale, he explained as his jacket rose and fell. Mr. Capper's daughter thought this was so very, very funny. Henry didn't see anything funny about it at all. The kittens grew more and more lively. Henry could not think what to say next. With that dog staring at him, he wished he could turn and run down the steps, but he knew he couldn't do that. Mr. Capper would want to know why he happened to be standing on the porch with his jacket full of kittens. Ruff! said Major eagerly. Quickly, Henry decided the best thing to do now that Mr. Capper knew what was making his jacket behave so strangely was to ignore the kittens and the dog as best as he could and end his visit quickly. Mr. Capper, could I have that paper route? He blurted out and instantly he was sorry. Man, that's not the way he had meant to ask for the job. <laughs> well, Henry, I'll tell you what to do, said Mr. Capper kindly. And for an instant, Henry felt hopeful. You wait until you're a year or two older and then come back and talk to me about a paper route. Still, Henry could not give up. I know I'm not very tall for my age, but I can ride a bike and I can throw straight and things. Well, there's more to a paper route than riding a bicycle and throwing papers, said Mr. Capper. A boy has to be able to handle money and see that the papers are delivered on time in every kind of weather and left on the porch or in the mailbox or wherever the subscribers want them delivered. There is more to a paper route than most people know about. Ouch! 
Henry could not, I'm okay, could not help exclaiming as he reached inside his jacket and unhooked a kitten's tiny claws from his t-shirt. I mean, I'm sure I can do all those things, Mr. Capper. I'm sure you can too, in a year or two, said Mr. Capper. His smile was friendly, but Henry knew he meant what he said. Well, thank you just the same, said Henry uncertainly. He turned and started down the steps. Thank you for coming to see me, said Mr. Capper. Don't forget what I said. Come back in a year or two. Ruff, said Major. A year or two, thought Henry as he, realized, as he walked down the steps. Didn't Mr. Capper realize that a year or two was practically forever? Just before Mr. Capper shut the door, Henry heard his daughter exclaim, Oh, Daddy, did you ever see anything so funny in your whole life? Can you imagine carrying kittens around in a jacket? I thought I would die laughing. Ugh, how unbusinesslike can I get anyway? Henry wondered as he rode glumly toward home. Nothing ever turned out the way he planned. He started out to get a paper route, and what did he have instead? Kittens. Four little old kittens. That was what he had. And what Henry began wondering, what his mother say about him bringing home four kittens? And what would Ribsy do? Can't you be still a minute? Henry asked a kitten that had climbed up his t-shirt and poked its furry little head out from under his chin again. Just the same, Henry decided. Somehow he would manage to get a paper route and he wouldn't wait a year or two either. He didn't know how he would do it, but his mind was made up. That was a long chapter, but that's the end of our chapter. Chapter two is Henry and the premiums. Ask your parents what a premium is. I love you guys. Stay safe. And I so, I so miss you. Please have your parents email me if they want to just send me pictures of you. I know one of my parents did that and I'm so grateful. I miss you guys and I love you very much. Please take care. Bye.